In science, often the simplest questions can bring you to the frontiers of understanding. One such question we could ask is simply, can something have too much mass? This might seem like a bit of a mundane and pointless question, but it immediately gets us to consider the fundamental limits of nature. Could something really be too massive? Suppose it couldn't, then the question would become, why? What rules of nature are stopping something getting too massive? On the other hand, suppose something could become too massive, then what would such an object look like and how would it interact with everything else? While mass is extremely important to the force of gravity, the more mass you have, the more gravity you have, and the more concentrated or dense the mass is, then the stronger gravity becomes. If we want to think about if there can be too much mass, then we need to be thinking about gravity. So we can change our question from can there be too much mass to can there be too much gravity. The thing is, gravity is a pretty weak force. We can all see this for ourselves because we each have the strength to beat the gravitational pull of the entire Earth, albeit momentarily, when we pick something up. So if we want to see if there can be too much gravity, then we either need an extraordinary amount of mass or an extremely dense form of matter. But if we were just to add the mass to, say, the Earth, then how much mass would we need? Clearly, the stars don't have too much gravity, otherwise they probably wouldn't exist. And the Sun is about 300,000 times the mass of the Earth, and the largest stars are about 100 times more massive than our Sun. So we know that if something is too massive or has too much gravity, it needs to be heavier than the heaviest stars in our universe. Or does it? You see, it's not necessarily that the mass is too low, but that the density of matter is too low in everything from you, me, to the Earth, Sun, and gigantic stars. Our cells in the Earth are light enough that the other forces, like the electromagnetic force, can happily push against gravity. Unlike us, the stars use energy from nuclear fusion at their core to fight gravity. But this energy doesn't last forever. For the largest stars, they run out of fuel for nuclear fusion after only around 10 million years. Once this happens, they have nothing left to fight against gravity. We could imagine the material of a star all suddenly feeling a pull towards the center of the star. And as the star starts to collapse and become more dense, the gravitational pull becomes stronger. This runaway collapse and increase in gravitational pull could, perhaps, lead to there being too much gravity. But again, what does this really mean to have too much gravity? Let's take a moment to look at some physics. In physics, people try to understand the universe through mathematics and equations. The mathematics can get pretty tricky, but it seems more often than not, that there is a way to explain nature through equations. This method of ascribing mathematics to nature is known as theoretical physics, and with it we can calculate the behavior of the universe from a falling apple to a dying star. The current theoretical framework of gravity is known as general relativity. This fantastic theory explains to us that space and time are intrinsically connected woven together to make the fabric of our universe. General relativity also tells us that the fabric of space-time can be bent and warped by massive objects, like the Earth and Sun. When first proposed in 1915 by Albert Einstein, the equations of general relativity matched beautifully with every observation at the time and made many predictions of what should happen as solutions to its complex equations. One solution to general relativity found by Carl Schwarzschild revealed something known as a singularity in the equations. In the solution, if you choose a certain size or radius for your object, then you would be met with a division by zero. To our calculators, this is affectionately known as undefined, but to a mathematician, it's called a singularity which to a physicist means an infinitely small and infinitely dense point in space a point where perhaps there is too much gravity. Now this special radius isn't just a mystery, it can be calculated with this equation here. 
On the left, we have the special radius, or a size which is known as the Schwarzschild radius. The Schwarzschild radius is then equal to the stuff on the right of the equation, where g is the fundamental gravitational constant of the universe, m is the mass of your object, c squared is the speed of light squared, and 2 is 2. And just like that, we've written down a mathematical description of when we would expect there to be too much gravity, which would make a gravitational singularity in the fabric of space-time. Now that we have an equation, let's calculate how small the Earth would need to be before it would have too much gravity and collapse into a singularity. So, g is equal to about 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11 meters cubed per kilogram per second squared. Quite a bizarre number, but that's okay. The mass of the Earth is about 6 times 10 to the power of 24 kilograms. Next, the speed of light is about 300,000 kilometers per second. And finally, 2 is 2. Putting all of that together, we calculate that the Earth would need to be squished to just a radius of 9 millimeters, or 18 millimeters across to form a singularity. That's very small indeed. But the Schwarzschild radius grows as the mass grows. For a massive star, the Schwarzschild radius is actually several thousands of kilometers across. So perhaps that's not actually unreasonable. See, this is the power of mathematics and theoretical physics. With just our minds, we can imagine fundamental rules of the universe and make calculations. But of course, just because we can imagine it, it doesn't necessarily mean singularities actually exist. For that, we need a theory to make testable predictions of what we would actually expect to see. In this case, general relativity predicts a number of things about these singularities. The first is that past the Schwarzschild radius, the gravitational pull or bending of space-time is so intense that nothing could ever hope to exit the object, including light. So the Schwarzschild radius should appear completely black. Because of this, we also call the Schwarzschild radius the event horizon, and this entire object, from event horizon to singularity, is known as a black hole. Another prediction is that the intense gravitational field of a black hole should bend and warp space-time outside of the event horizon so that light will be bent around the black hole. This is known as gravitational lensing. The final prediction we'll talk about here is that if a black hole moves quickly through space, it will send out ripples or waves in the fabric of space-time itself. This prediction is known as gravitational waves. With these three predictions, astronomers and physicists can search the universe for evidence of black holes, or areas where there is too much gravity. For astronomers, the way to search for black holes is to search for objects that appear to be orbiting nothing. The physicists, however, had a much harder challenge ahead of them. They had to search for tiny ripples in space-time caused by black holes moving and merging with one another. So let's start with astronomy. In 1964, just 48 years since Carl Schwarzschild's solution, astronomers found the first hints of a black hole in an object called Cygnus X1. As one of the brightest sources of X-ray light in the sky, Cygnus X1 was easy to spot, but puzzling. In the system 6,000 light years away from us, a disk of super hot material swirls around and fires jets from a seemingly empty patch of space. The material in this disk was stolen from a giant star, which is slowly being eaten alive by an invisible companion, 15 times more massive than our sun. Already it seems like there could indeed be things like black holes in our universe. Now, let's return again to the collapsing star from before. The star is many times heavier than our sun, and it is imploding under a growing gravitational pull. If this star were lighter, then perhaps the pressure between subatomic particles, like neutrons and protons, could stop the collapse and make a neutron star alongside a spectacular explosion. But this star seems to be too heavy. There is nothing that can stop it from collapsing. 
In images taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of galaxy NGC 6946, eight years apart, we can see our star there in one image and gone in the next. No explosion was seen by any telescope, it simply just vanished. The mystery of our disappearing star looks an awful lot like a massive star directly collapsing into a black hole. But perhaps it could have been something else entirely, no definitive proof for black holes yet. It has also been suggested that at the center of each galaxy lurks a gargantuan black hole. Looking toward the center of our galaxy, astronomers see again something peculiar massive stars being flung around an empty point in space, known as Sagittarius A star. For decades, astronomers at the European Southern Observatory watched the stars at the center of our galaxy. And although each star is more massive than our sun, they sling around an empty patch in space. Based on the motion of these stars, the invisible thing they orbit had a mass of around 4 million times that of our sun. So we have an extremely massive object, which is also seemingly invisible. That sounds to me like a black hole. But again, it's possible that it's something else, something we haven't thought of yet. Through the decades of astronomers finding phenomena that behaved like black holes, experimental and theoretical physicists were hard at work. Over the course of a hundred years, they improved our understanding of black hole physics, calculated how two black holes could merge, and constructed incredible instruments to measure tiny distortions in space. These instruments were built to detect distortions in space-time from the collision and merger of black holes. With their incredible gravitational pull, black holes spinning around each other bend and warp space, sending out gravitational waves. These gravitational waves, however, are more like gravitational ripples on the edge of detectability. To detect these ripples, physicists built the LIGO detectors, which could measure distances so precisely that it could detect a change in length just one ten thousandth the size of a proton. This insane sensitivity is equivalent to measuring the distance to Alpha Centauri, which is 4.3 light years away from us, to the accuracy of a human hair. It's unbelievable how sensitive the LIGO instruments are, but perhaps it's even more astounding that they worked. In the first run in 2015, the twin LIGO detectors detected the first conclusive proof of black holes. The merger of two black holes, one and a half billion light years away from us. Almost unbelievably, the gravitational waves detected match theoretical predictions almost perfectly. The mathematics of how two black holes merge was correct. Physicists had conclusively found evidence for black holes, evidence that proved human imagination and mathematics can explore the limits of nature. This first detection was just the beginning. Since 2015, many more black hole mergers have been detected, sending their ripples through spacetime. Although the ripples may be small, the energy it takes to bend space-time isn't. At the point of collision, each of these mergers burn more energy bending space-time than all of the stars in the observable universe emit in a given second. With the LIGO and now Virgo detectors, we have discovered black holes of all different sizes, some around just 10 times the mass of our sun, but others around 80 times the mass of our sun. And those are a bit puzzling, since their mass is too high to be produced by dying stars, but also too low to form like supermassive black holes. These oddly intermediate black holes may themselves be the result of past mergers, or perhaps they're relics from the beginning of our universe. So theoretically, we know black holes exist, but can we actually see them, take an image of them to directly see the effect they have on space-time? To answer this, we need to return to astronomy with another incredible experiment. No single telescope is capable of imaging even the closest black hole. Their resolutions are just too low. But in radio astronomy, you can easily link telescopes up over vast distances, 
to increase the image resolution through a technique known as interferometry. In a technical achievement, astronomers link telescopes from across the world together spanning from Antarctica to Europe and North America. This massive network of telescopes is known as the Event Horizon Telescope and it effectively turns the entire Earth into a single telescope. A telescope capable of imaging the event horizon of supermassive black holes. And in 2019, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration revealed the first image. An image of the supermassive black hole in the galaxy M87, 53 million light years away from us. The image doesn't directly show the black hole, instead it shows the disk of material falling into the black hole. The light from this disk is bent and warped, giving it an uneven brightness, something that was predicted by theoretical models. So again, with mathematics and imagination, we could predict exactly how nature should behave. So after showing us that you can have too much mass and make black holes, the LIGO, Virgo and Event Horizon Telescope are still gathering data. The gravitational wave detectors search for new and bizarre signals from colliding black holes, while the Event Horizon Telescope studies other nearby supermassive black holes, including the one in our galaxy, Sagittarius A-star. Although we know that black holes exist and can largely predict how they behave, the details of these objects remain a mystery. What happens at the edge of the event horizon? Do they really emit Hawking radiation? And what happens past the event horizon? Could it lead you to somewhere else entirely? For now, no one knows the answers to these questions and we need to explore this new scientific frontier. We start this video by asking a simple question. Can something have too much mass? Although simple, the answer to this question is anything but. To answer it, we needed 100 years of progress, thousands of scientists pushing the limits of understanding, and incredible experiments. How amazing is it that we are the first generation of people to definitively know something can have too much mass and form a black hole? This was just one simple question. What other simple questions remain unanswered? And what will they teach us about the universe?